Welcome to uh, Cambridge Forum. Tonight we're discussing the, the new book, All Governments Lie, The Life and Times of Rebel Journalist I.F. Stone with the author Myra McPherson. I'm Jack Beatty, Senior Editor at the Atlantic Monthly. Feisty, skeptical, independent, and revered I.F. or Izzy Stone taught a generation of journalists to doubt government propaganda, dig deep for facts, and find whistleblowers who told the truth. What is his legacy for journalists today? Could a figure like him emerge in the 24-7 world of cable news and talk radio? Author Myra McPherson brings Stone and his world to life and explores his relevance for 20th, 21st century Americans and their media in her definitive biography of this iconic figure in the history of American journalism. Myra McPherson is the author of three previous books, including the Vietnam War classic, Long Time Passing, long known for her work at the Washington Post. She has also written for the New York Times and numerous magazines. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Myra McPherson. <laughs> yes, we're going to do a Burns and Allen thing here. Yeah. Now, now, we're going we're to begin in 1920 or thereabouts, and here's a young man sitting in his father's dry goods store in Haddonfield, New Jersey, when, a, when, a, uh, when a, an heiress walks in and uh, makes a discovery. Her name is Jill Litt Stern and she's the heiress for one of Philadelphia's leading department stores, and she walks into the store on this day. Now, as I have said it, one afternoon Mrs. Stern walked into Feinstein's Dry Goods Emporium to buy some blue ribbons. Inside the darkened store was a lone child wearing huge round glasses hunched over a book. Izzy had been dragooned into watching the store for his parents. He did not look up when the, she entered, nor did he make any attempt to disengage himself. Mrs. Stern cleared her throat. Still, he did nothing. She said rather sternly, young man, I see you're reading a book. Izzy stopped long enough to reply, yes. Taken aback by his indifference to waiting on her, Mrs. Stern then commanded, what? Are you reading? Izzy startled her speechless. Looking up, this gnome with his owlish gaze, age 12, gave a withering one-word reply, Spinoza. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that gives you the measure of this prodigy who was a giant in Amer independent American journalism from the 20s through the 80s. And, and Myra, you've, you've done justice to the whole thing, to the times, the man, and above all, the flavor of the man. That Thank comes you. through here to those who, of us fortunate enough to have known him. The hardest part was trying not to cut Izzy. I mean, you know, this is supposedly a book about him, but every time I turned around, there was something else I wanted to use. And, and this uh, Mrs. Stern, the reason she was so incredibly pivotal to Izzy was that her f husband, was J. David Stern, who owned the Camden paper, the uh, uh, Philadelphia paper, and then the New York Post when it was a liberal paper. And he hired Izzy at age 15, as he said he was a little boy in knee pants, and gets a job with him. And he was his mentor, and Izzy worked for him for 15 years in some of the most pivotal and fascinating time of America. I fell madly in love with rereading the 30s because it was a time, and so many people remember Izzy from his four-page weekly, which started in, in um, uh, 53, the great year of, uh, of McCarthyism and lasted till 71. But in, in the 30s, he was an absolutely dogged reporter, and he one of his great um, comments was, if you're going to interview somebody, go into the bowels of government. Find somebody who isn't truly at the top form, and uh, they will actually give you so much more. And one of his favorite ones, story was when he broke a story about how the American cartels we're still doing business with uh, Nazi Germany, 
And uh, it was page one. He was getting tons of page one exposés at a time when most people didn't know. And he was very much ahead of everybody on the most pivotal trends from the labor movement to the rise of fascism. Um, he used to say that the only thing that was worse than fascism were typos. <laughs> 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 but, but, but he, uh, uh, and, 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 I twin him with Walter Lippmann in this book because I have Mr. Insider and Mr. Outsider. And, and um, you know, when uh, Lippmann went to uh, Paris, his home, his forwarding address was care of Charles de Gaulle, <laughs> which is a lot different than any Izzy friends. But Izzy uh, was so prescient about what Hitler was doing. And you read him and you compare him with Lippmann, who didn't write a thing, and if he did, it was just sort of semi-laudatory. He also never wrote much about the Spanish Civil War, and Izzy was uh, telegraphing that this was going to be the rehearsal for World War II. And then, of course, in much more recent times, he's been writing things, he wrote things that just resonate. You'd think that he wrote them this morning, half of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, his, uh, it's the prescience and also the, the prose. This man could write. That's what makes this stuff live. It wasn't just that he had a bunch of opinions that... that yeah, but he also that. had the kind of one-liner ability in addition to this incredible brilliance and substance, and he would write as I, very eloquently. But he had the one-liners that uh, John Stewart would envy. Um, of the, the second part of my title is All Governments Lie, and I was thinking about it as I was listening to the vice president talking about how no matter everything that had happened with this war, we would do it all over the same way we had done it. And uh, uh, Izzy's great line was, all governments lie, but disaster lies in wait for countries whose leaders uh, smoke the same hashish they give out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I've got another one of his, uh, his one-liners. This was about Teddy White. Oh, known yes. to so many of us as the inside author of the, you know, Making of the President series. He said of Teddy White, a man who can be so universally admiring need never lunch alone. <laughs> <laughs> and he also had this line about, um, I was thinking about this when all of the newspapers of today did the mea culpas about how they had been so wrong about weapons of mass destruction. And uh, Izzy um, was was so far ahead in thinking about all of the, I mean, I'm sure he would, I would just love to be reading what he's reading, writing about this if he were around. But um, the Washington Post had a major story by Walter Pincus that they buried on page A17 in which they, he reiterated that there were people who were having grave doubts about the knowledge of any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And Izzy, um, the line that I love of his is he said that, he, that the Washington Post was an exciting paper to read because you never knew on what page you'd find a page one story. <laughs> <laughs> Myra, you say at one point what Izzy was fighting for, civil liberty, free speech, peace in the world, truth in government, and a humane society. How did he come by these values? Well, you know, it's difficult. In some ways, I wanted to say that his wonderful daughter Celia is here, and um, he imparted so much wonderful wisdom to Celia, and she's given me some uh, letters from the family. But Izzy was not one of these people who sat around and analyzed himself and how he became what he, he used to just come up with little simple answers that I was always for the underdog. But my opinion after reading everything is that uh, he was really shaped by two things. One was the crucible of his time when fascism was such a great threat, and also by his roots. His parents, his, fa his father literally escaped uh, the Russian army and walked on foot to get out of Russia uh, during the pogroms, and his mother came over, um, and they came two years before Izzy was born, and he fell in love with this country and thought this was the one place where people could be free to speak and think. And I think he was shaped by that a childhood. And I wanted to, if I can find it, I wanted to give you this, um, th this wonderful quote of his about, about America being what, what it should be. And he said, um, 
I wrote that many on the left and the right could never get straight what Stone was all about, defending the right of any person or group, no matter how odious, to speak freely. In 1949, for example, a $100 fine for breach of peace uh, um, had been set up against what was known as a Jew baiting priest who was suspended. And Izzy wrote, I am, I suppose, exactly what Terman Yellow in his harangues meant by an atheistic, communistic, Zionistic Jew. But I would not demean myself or my people by not denying him the right to say it. Stone said he did not hold the liberties I enjoy as an American in so little esteem that I am prepared to run from them like a rabbit when one utters gutter paranoia. And uh, he also um, wrote extremely poignantly about during the witch hunts when a, when a very um, upper class American was being grilled and Izzy Sat, sat there listening to him and he just felt so sad that he said that our mutual country had come to such a debasing level that people were being questioned about their political beliefs and who they were and this man was resorting to his roots like he'd come over on the Mayflower and whatever and as he said you know as a second generation born person he sat there sad and this was this great wistful line and he said that I still have a little boy's awe for somebody who can sing the line, land where my fathers died, and not feel awkward about it. Yes, and yet one of your leading sources for this man's life was J. Edgar Hoover Absolutely. and the FBI. <laughs> he was the best researcher I ever had. <laughs> the malevolent soul that he is. Um, I would say something else except we're being filmed. Uh, he had 5,000 pages on I.F. Stone, and uh, some of them are redacted, some of them are, you know, you can't find anything in them. But what was interesting is I was talking to an FBI agent at the time I was seeking these, and I had to sue and kept, it took 10 years to get them all. And uh, I said, well, you're reading the, the stuff that I'm not gonna be able to read, right? And I said, if you ever, is there anything in there? He said, oh, this is he. He said, he was really a character. He wrote about everything and he knocked everything. And I'm thinking, this is an FBI agent. It wasn't like the ones I'd heard of in the past. And, it, and so he said, I can see why Hoover hated him because Hoover was such a rigid man. And this is very true. Izzy was followed from mid 30s till the day Hoover drew his last breath. And he found absolutely nothing on him. But he felt that he had to, to keep exploring this man who absolutely uh, would not uh, bend to anything he said or did. And so the guy said, well, this is a great guy. Who's going to play him in the movie? <laughs> I said, I was talking to him on the phone. I said, well, how tall are you? And he said, well, I'm pretty tall. And he said, what about Dustin Hoffman? And I said, okay, but, but I want to find, you, do you talk about something else? Because I want to find this phrase. Okay, of, well, of let theirs. me. I, I, I just want to get at this, at this patriot in Izzy. This is, he, he takes a trip to Europe right after the war, and then he writes about America. How many of us are thankful that our own country was spared, that our children did not jump from their beds as the warning air raid sirens screamed in the nights, that we did not huddle with our families in the subways, that our daughters were not shipped into slavery and our mothers sealed into death cars, that our cities are not gutted by bombs, our children's faces pinched by hunger. That's how the men wrote. Wrote beautifully. There's another um, one that I love, and that was written at the time of the uh, Vietnam War, and it was in 1961, and he was talking about the information that had been written that was so fashionable at the Pentagon. And he said, it was written by men watching a dance from outside through heavy plate glass windows. They see the motions, but they can't hear the music. What rarely comes through to them are the injured racial feelings, the misery, the rankling slights, the hatred, the devotion, the inspiration, and the desperation. So they do not really understand what leads men to abandon wife, children, home, 
career and friends to take to the bush and live gun in hand like a hunted animal, to challenge overwhelming military odds rather than acquiesce any longer in humiliation, injustice, or poverty. And he was always looking at all sides of the question and looking at how other people viewed us and how we viewed them. And uh, he was so much wiser than most of us. As I said, you just can't emulate him, but, but he had some very strong rules for journalism. And my dear friend Ellen Goodman is here, and she certainly followed them. But I wanted to just uh, briefly say, he always said, don't trust the government. All governments lie. He knew that that was their motivational base, is to, just to tell the story the way they saw, saw it should be told. And it was a journalist's job to get behind it. Another was to keep on reading the documents. He was the first journalist in America to um, break the Gulf of Tonkin sham excuse for going to Vietnam. And most people don't know that he did it two weeks after Lyndon Johnson um, said that this was what was caused. And he did it by looking at the files. And he started reading everything. And he said, if, there were, if they had hit a, a ship of ours in the Gulf of Tonkin, there would be debris. Why isn't there anybody writing about debris? He was almost like a, a, a lawyer in his ability to, to examine things. And of course, he also said, don't get palsy with, with sources. And that was one of his major points. And he said, in Washington, you really have to wear your ja chastity belt to preserve your journalistic virginity, because once the Secretary of State asks you to lunch and asks your opinion, you're sunk. And I have seen this over and over with people that I see just falling into the pattern of somebody, some member of the White House calling them by their first name and being gaga about it. And Izzy was just absolute about that. And he also, as I said, go down and get stories from people below. And he said, you must bone up first so that you can't be uh, uh, off guard when somebody gives you an answer and you don't know that that answer is a lie. So he has a lot of very good reasons to be listened to and learn to learn from today. Yes, and he brought Spinoza and company to the party. Yes, always. He, he inflected and, his, his even reporting on daily matters in journalism with this his oh, he own was, learning. He was and he, absolutely. And he wasn't about a that. college graduate either. No, he actually graduated third from his class in high school, and third. that's third from the last. <laughs> and he always he once told me he said I wasn't dumb, I just didn't do any homework. But he became a major autodidact. He went off, and uh, you know, uh, Celia's told me about the the house, which is was full of seven thousand books, and how Izzy would burst up at lunchtime or dinner and start speaking poetry and he just collected everything in that incredible mind of his and he had a great memory and he utilized it which is why his work stands up today because it just doesn't have that that sense that it's of the moment he always has explanations in it and out and even when he was wrong it was interesting <laughs> and, and and we should say that in this weekly that he ran indeed in his life he had a remarkable partner he writes sir dear dolly i love you i'm getting awfully tired of this place san francisco and i wish I were back home with you and the kids going to a corner movie to bed at 9.30, playing the piano, and having a drink once every two weeks. Yes. Uh, tell us of, 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 of Stone and Stone. What a, you, you really bring out how, uh, how this was a joint venture in every sense of the word. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I interviewed so many of the people that worked for Izzy and had been his uh, assistants, and they, and they said that Esther was the best thing that ever happened to him, and that he probably would have never been able to to um, succeed as well as he did. She was she did an awful lot of work on the weekly, and she was the um, uh, she handled all the bills and and the um, uh, there's a she had a cute little line on on her uh, desk that said "Good news is on the way," and she backed him and everything, and she wrote one letter to him, which I think so solidifies how she felt about him. She said, you wear the mantle of greatness. 
Oh. Now, what man could uh, resist that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she just was his everything in that respect. And he loved and admired her. And she was also a great reader. She read Dostoevsky a lot. She would reread things and uh, raise the kids. I mean, did most of the, the raising of the kids. But Izzy was there with all that ebullience. And, and his inability to um, ever not stop saying what he wanted to say and think. That's why I think the whole business of the FBI, which refutes entirely the fact that he was ever a communist even, let alone a spy, as some of these wretched uh, right-wingers have been trying to say. I spent quite a bit of time in that in the book explaining that. But he, um, he was just indomitable. And um, his, uh, Celia tells a story about when she got married and they eloped and Izzy, they went across the street to, across from Washington to Virginia, and they called with some champagne to tell their parents, and Izzy said, well, I don't know if this story is true or not, but get the car back. I have to deliver the papers. <laughs> <laughs> the wedding would have to uh, yes, yeah. pull up. Oh, well, that's just great. Let's, uh, let's, let's hear from, uh, from our audience uh, for, some, for some questions, Myra. You're, you're joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Myra McPherson discussing All Governments Lie, her biography of journalist I.F. Stone. Uh, if people could come to the microphone and speak, uh, perhaps identify yourself or not, we'd be happy to take the questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Terence Rothman. Uh, Myra McPherson, thank you ever so much for being here, and I'm sure to, to find time to read your wonderful book. I would like to thank uh, Cambridge Forum for choosing the date of the ratification of the Bill of Rights to hold this forum. Uh, the question I have involves a personal experience here in uh, Cambridge, and my hope that you will be able to make a suggestion as to how to resolve this conflict. All Saints Church in Pasadena, California is being investigated by the IRS in reference to a sermon which the pastor held right. uh, questioning um, the legitimacy of the war in Iraq. Right. Uh, the IRS investigation, uh, I believe, is in violation of not only the freedom of speech but also the separation of church and state, and if I would say this, the freedom of theology. Um, the problem that I'm having uh, with the Faith Lutheran Church on Broadway here in Cambridge, Massachusetts involves my efforts to start a peace group at Faith Lutheran. The church council and the pastor have forbidden me to come back to the church to worship and my hope is that someone would be willing to try to mediate with this problem. There has been no violence, but this problem, I sure, think, has to be looked sure. into. You know, this is a, a question that Izzy would love to write about, but it, uh, and I think you've just done something. You've made it, uh, a big radio audience aware of it, and uh, can we just leave it at that since other people have questions about Izzy, but you're, that this is the sort of thing he would champion, and, uh, and he would certainly, uh, you know, he would certainly uh, stand up uh, for, that, for that pastor and, and for you, but uh, I think, uh, unless you've got a question about Izzy, I think we should go what, on. What would Izzy write about in this? Oh, this there you are. <laughs> so. Hi. Um, I still have a few copies of I Have Stones, of I Have Stones Weekly from when I was a young person getting active in the student movement and the anti-war movement uh, and had a chance to hear him and, and meet him uh, in later years of his life when he was beginning to get interested in uh, Greek democracy, I think, especially. Um, I have two questions. The first, about what you said about it took 10 years th using the Freedom of Information Act to get the information. Coincidentally, a movie coming out at the end of this week, U.S. versus John Lennon, John Wiener, I believe is his name, it took him 10 years to get a lot of the documentation that's part yes. of the infrastructure for that film. What is it about the freest country in the world that takes 10 years to get what are supposed to be readily available public doc, you know, documents for the public, and what is happening currently under the Bush administration to the Freedom of Information Act. It's, well, and then, <laughs> should I go ahead with the second, or leave yes, it? Yes, go ahead. The, um, the second is, 
The title of the book, All Governments Lie When, when Izzy Was Alive, I think could be taken as a wake-up call to Americans, you know, a sort of um, don't be so gullible. Nowadays, I think the title almost has the quality of, well, what do you expect? I mean, yeah, I know. you know, this one lies, but they all do, so we shouldn't be too troubled that they lied about Iraq, so what? Um, and uh, then you get the question which you've touched on, and which he, of course, was very involved in, which is the ways in which uh, what I choose to call corporate media uh, pass these lies straight through. They're a transmission belt for these lies, and I'd really be interested to hear you, because you worked at the Post and you've already talked about it a little, I'd like to hear you elaborate a little on what you think has been happening with this really rather dismal failure of, of corporate media in this country. Well, um, I will. I, I wanted to just start out with saying that this book is really about Izzy. I do say some of these things in my introduction quite heavily, and I will uh, go into them, but the, I, the Freedom of Information Act, Right now, it's in the worst shape it's been uh, since Reagan, I think. I mean, Reagan put, pushed it back. Uh, the, its finest hour was in the 70s when it was first written, and they, you, were being, you were able to get much more free information. It's utterly sad and outrageous and ridiculous. I filled up all the things that said, look, there's no, there are no national secrets here. Not only is I have Stone dead, all of his informant, these informants who, as he always called them, were moochers, paid moochers for the FBI. No one could nail them, and it just and you get the stuff. And as I said, everything there's there's an enormous amount of stuff that's uh, still blacked out when you do get it, and it's an issue that is so vital. But I don't see anybody pushing for it. I think people don't understand it. There are a few people, Scott Armstrong and others, uh, the National Archivists uh, try for it, but it is not a simple thing. And uh, I just uh, I just really feel that it's it's much worse than than it can possibly be. And as far as my feelings <laughs> about Today, I said, instead of reporting scandals, establishment newspapers created them. Fiction appeared in articles in the New York Times, the self-proclaimed newspaper of record. Both the Time and the Washington po Times and the Washington Post were forced to issue mea culpas. Um, the the uh, unbelievable sanction of going to war, the embedded journalist who just sat there, and I think you, you put your finger on when you said it's a very corporate-owned uh, process today, and um, there isn't anybody who's free free from it. And um, I don't see a very happy future. I'm one of the people who who happens to be very very disgusted with what I see as a sort of a not only a, a sort of a disinterest in finding the news. As he used to say, he never minded uh, the presence of opinions. What he, what he really you know, hated was the absence of news. <laughs> and uh, that's what happens when you do not dig and when you do not look. And um, you know, everybody, we can go on and on endlessly about blogs and uh, what's good and bad and different about them. And they do have a place for individual voices. I think the one good thing about blogs is you can find great columns that you can't find in the Washington Post and the New York Times. If you want to find Molly Ivins or anybody else, you can find them in a way, and you can find a lot of factual stuff if you look for it. And the newspapers are in a quandary because they keep losing readership, and they're losing readership among the young, and they don't know what to put in, so they put in a lot of celebrity trash, just like there is on television. I was trying to find out more about the, the uh, Guantanamo uh, decision of the Supreme Court and I kept fiddling with television, uselessly, stupidly, me, and all there was on was John Bonet's possible killer. I mean, and it was just, uh, it's just awful. I think cable television has, has become a, a really bad place. You find some people who ask good questions, but that's not M the realm. Myra, you've worked for a major paper, the Washington yeah. Post, so you've been inside. Give us, a, give us a picture of the pressures that are on a journalist. Try, uh, trying to do what Izzy did. Well, I trying was, to tell the truth. I was about there government. in the golden years. I started writing there in '68, and I I did a lot of the Watergate profiles, and um, 
There was, we had a, Ben Bradley was just as tough as they come, but fair, and it was, you know, get the story, and he, you just had to be right. I mean, you, you couldn't be wrong, which would scare the hell out of you, but, you know, you, if you got it right, it, it went in. And uh, I did a lot of what we call essay, uh, in, sort of in, insight into politicians and their points of view and what they were doing and profiles. And um, it, I think what happens, and it's, I, I really get into this, and excuse me, but I have a view that what I call faux objectivity versus real objectivity. And faux objectivity is when you go out and the president says something and you have to get it in. I mean, the journalism business is consumed with the idea that if a, if a person of stature says it, we have to run it. And I think it's much worse today because the deadlines are just constants, constants, constants. And, you, and then when something comes in to change it, or factually, I mean, I can remember being on the road covering some political campaigns and we'd say, get whatever the presidential candidate said. There'd be somebody back at the post who could say, I want you to back this up, double check it. And then there was the so what paragraph that said, he said this, but this is what it meant. That doesn't happen anymore. And I think partly it's just horrific deadline schedules. And another reason, I mean, Walter Lippmann went on about McCarthy saying, well, we have to quote him because he's a senator. And, you know, if we, we then if the lies show up later, and then Richard Rovere, who was a great writer at the time, said, but you also have to say that he's a liar. And, yeah. and, and that's what I mean by real objectivity versus faux objectivity. Right. And everybody, and there's a great line of uh, Scotty Reston that I use, and he said, just because we put quote marks around what McCarthy said does not free us up from the complicity yeah. of, of writing it. And um, yeah. that's the way yeah, I yeah. feel about it. Here, here. And, 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 and you show here how advertisers in the 30s uh, for the New York Post, in fact, Izzy quit the Post yeah. because he couldn't write things too critical of the Roosevelt administration uh, in the... In the uh, well, it, it, it really was... Yeah, I can't get into that because it's yeah. too long, but there are four or five different stories of what exactly happened to Izzy right, at that right. paper. I said it's like a Russia Montale, whoever. I have them in the book, but every single but, one. But the advertisers but, made them known they didn't like Macy's well, the, and Gimbel's, didn't like whatever yes, he was writing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Listen, thanks. Uh, yes, sir. My name is Michael Brower. I've been a resident of Cambridge for 50 years, and I subscribed to Izzy's newsletter for at least 15 of the years that he published it. Jack Beatty, I admire your appearance on NPR. Uh, I listen as often as I can, and I'm always glad to hear it if you He's do. also a great writer. <laughs> you have to read his, read his books. Thank and, you. And uh, you'll enjoy him, and thank you for writing this book. Uh, I have a question which you may not want to answer or may not be able to answer. You've mentioned some of the great journalists of the past. I have only two candidates in mind. Do you have any who might be worthy of walking in Izzy's yeah. shoes today? You mentioned Molly Ivins. I'd put her high up on my Cy list, Hirsch. but there's two others. Cy Hirsch. Uh, Cy Hirsch, yes. Da he was David Korn uh, and The Nation has been doing you know, great stuff. Joe Connison was very good on the Whitewater mm -hmm. stuff when everybody was looking mm -hmm. the other way. Mm -hmm. I think columnists like Ellen Goodman are, are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. You're here. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not all, they don't all, no, no one has all of Izzy, but you can mm -hmm. find facets of Izzy. I also think that um, Josh Marshall is good on talking points. I mean, most of us in this age group, I don't think read the internet like younger people do. Mm -hmm. um, and But when I do, I find some, Bob Perry of Consortium News mm -hmm. is very, very good. I also I love Frank Rich, uh, Bob Herbert, um, Paul Krugman. Oh, uh, Paul Krugman. You know, they're, Krugman, yeah. they're, they're, mm. they're all out there explaining. And what Izzy did so well was he, he, he was an inspiration. Um, but he was, he was always trying to explain more, though, you know, what was behind what was being said mm -hmm. and what was behind what he was reading. And that's what I think the best of today's journalists do. That's Who are your two candidates, Mr. Brown? Uh, you didn't mention, uh, aside from uh, 
half of those you mentioned I'm familiar with. You only said two. You. So. <laughs> but the two you didn't mention are Greg Pallast. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. And a Democracy Now!, what's her name? Uh, Amy, uh, Amy Goodman. Goodman. Amy Goodman, yeah. I'm sorry, oh, right? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. And Amy Goodman, that's on Pacifica Radio as well, right? Yes. And, and don't overlook what John Stewart does, because the yes. stuff... Yes, I would say John Stewart. Yeah. Yeah. Because what they do yeah. is sort of what yeah. Izzy did. If yeah. you read the weekly, he used to have his little boxes, yeah. and he would say, this is what they said yesterday, this is what they said five mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah. I mean, he, he caught McNamara yeah. in yeah. more lies. Yeah. Of course, that's yeah. not e yeah. difficult. I mean, he lied all the but, time, but uh, he caught him in lie after lie and would point yeah. them out. And yeah. that's this whole business, I think, that we need, uh, what is behind those yeah. Comments. But if I could just put a quick plug in, Greg Pallas has a weekly column and he wrote a book called The Best Democracy That Money Can Buy. You should read it. And Amy Goodman is on Cambridge Community TV. So if you subscribe mm -hmm. to cable, 8 to 9 every morning and 9 p.m. every night, I think she's America's greatest living journalist. Yeah, she's great. Good for you. Here, here. Thank you. Hey. Oh, Whoa. I wish I could stay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, two others I would mention would be uh, John Pilger and uh, Robert Fisk, the British journalist. Oh, yeah. Uh, but uh, my question doesn't have to do with that. It has to do with something else that uh, Izzy said uh, in an issue that he took up that the, uh, quite courageously at that time, at he, in his own time, that the American press doesn't do now. In 67, after the yeah. uh, war uh, in the Middle East, uh, there was a special edition of Le Temps Moderne in uh, Paris, in France, uh, which took up the issue of uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. And Izzy did a long review of that huh, much longer issue in which he made the following comment. He said, as a Jew closely bound uh, emotionally with the birth of Israel, I feel honor bound to report the Arab side, especially since the US press is so overwhelmingly pro-Zionist. Today, today, 39 years later, uh, the U.S. press, including the Washington Post and the Atlantic, are still overwhelmingly pro-Zionist, and I'm sure Izzy will be turning over in his grave to know that uh, they don't feel honor-bound to present the Arab side of the story or to be as critically honest as he was on this issue. Uh, do you think that uh, the American press is living up to Izzy's standards on this issue? Yeah. I'm going to duck that, but I want to... No, I thought so. Uh, no, I mean, I don't... I'm not... I really don't feel that I'm knowledgeable enough to say that, but I... But I... I no. If you'll excuse me for saying so, that's a typical reaction whenever you ask these questions. No, well. no, my problem is that I'm really not feeling qualified enough. From my point of view, I think it, that it has been ducked. But I am not a student of what's been, write, been well, written about the Middle East, uh, enough for me to say something. Although, but I do want to say what Izzy said, and Izzy said this um, uh, 20 years ago. And he said, um, and before that, he went to Israel in 46 with the um, Holocaust survivors. He was the only uh, reporter in the world who was, went with them and broke through the, uh, the whole refugee uh, business, breaking through the British blockade. And he was very much feeling very much as a Jew, and he was very close to all those people. But even then, he wrote that Israel cannot survive unless it is a binational state. And he lost, he lost a lot of readership because he kept that in his book. But what he said, and I think this is a, there is no way to have peace without some modicum of justice. The Arabs cannot be held in second-class citizenship and bondage. If something does, isn't done pretty soon, the lines may harden. Each side will destroy its own moderates, and then they will move on to destroy each other. Mm. Yeah. But my problem with it now is that with what's gone on in Lebanon, I personally feel rather confused about a lot of the, a lot of the whole thing. You're I think watching was, what was going on in Gaza at the same time as what was going on in uh, well, Lebanon. But, but in but, fairness, uh, the, the, the coverage of the Lebanon war, it seems to me, but certainly on NPR, and I would say in the, in the, in the uh, Times as well, 
you couldn't read it, but reading about the destruction of the buildings, reading about the, oh, even reading about what had happened to the Israeli reservists and how they were thrown up there by their government without proper equipment and their feeling of betrayal. I mean, it seems to me that that was a, it's hard to see Zionist bias in the coverage of that war, which was an international disaster for Israel on all kinds of counts, and partly because of that hard-hitting, truthful news, it seems to me. Well, a lot was left out, but uh, at the same time, it obscured what was going on, as I just mentioned, in Gaza, parallel to that. Sure. And that has been the story for the last 39 years, so I won't belabor it. But. No, no, but I, but I should say I remember once going with Izzy to a, to a gathering that was, a, it was a, talking about Palestinian rights, and he was, he, was, he was lionized, he was praised, and then he sat down and he said, talking to, to these representatives then of the PLO, he said, you've just got to get past the hatred. Yeah. You've just got to get past that and into a place where you can recognize that you both occupy the same land and you've got to come to an agreement. And they didn't want to hear it. So uh, he, he spoke, uh, he, he not only spoke truth to power, he spoke truth to righteousness too. Yes, sir. Yeah. I just wanted to, before I uh, make, ask my question, is make a comment that I last heard Greg Pallast about 10 days ago. And he commented that he had been subpoenaed by the uh, Homeland Security Department for some stuff that he had said. And I'm not quite sure what happened because he was going to be called up before them in a couple of days. Who was this? Greg Pallas. Oh, the, the writer. And it might be interesting to find out what, in fact, did happen uh, when he was called up before them. I mean, right, I right. guess uh, they have a lot more mm -hmm. power than mm -hmm. they should. Mm -hmm. the, the question or the comment I have has to do with the statement, all governments lie, because there are crimes and there are crimes. I mean, uh, Clinton got basically impeached for jaywalking. He had some peccadillo. Bush has been responsible for God knows oh, how many yes. thousands or hundreds of thousands of deaths of uh, Iraqis. Uh, who knows how much American lives, uh, before all is said and done, at least a trillion dollars of our, of our yes. money, you know, a, a, a pittance of which could have gone to New Orleans and saved that city. And so I think it's a pretty tricky business to sort of paint the jaywalkers and the murderers with the same brush. Mm. And I think it's very, because the Republicans use that. They say, well, you, you people break the law too. And uh, there's got to well, be some distinction. Quote. It was an easy quote that I fell in it's love with. It's a question of proportionality. And I think it's important to somehow make that very, very clear as well, to what this proportionality is. Well, if you, if you read my book and if you read my introduction, you'll see exactly where I am on that well, position. Well, that may be, but somebody's going to look at the book, you know, in passing at the Harvard bookstore or some other place and say, well, I it's guess... It's not my quote. Not. It's Izzy's. Yeah, Sorry. And yet, and yet, you know, suppo suppose a generation of journalists who came of age in the 1980s and 90s actually thought that, actually saw that. Absolutely. Would we Would we have had these essentially stenography lessons that we had yes. from our press as they stenographized whatever Rumsfeld was saying and just passed on all this, all this uh, spoiled information? I, they forgot that. Yeah, I agree with you completely on that. But what, what, what happened 25 years ago may, may have changed by now and that people can, the wrong people can use that kind of yeah. argument for ammunition. I mean, you, most of the, the people I try talking with who are supporters of Bush, they say, well, look at what Clinton did. You know, yeah, like somehow there was an saying. equivalence. Yeah, right, that. right. He, That's scary. <laughs> that is really scary. Yeah. He lied about sex. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's well taken. No, I think so. Just. Uh. Hi, I'm a visitor from uh, Canada. My name is uh, Richard uh, Simeon. I, as a student journalist years ago, I. F. Stone was my hero, and I once had the enormous luck of bumping into him in an elevator in San Francisco. Uh, which led to a two-hour conversation with a bunch of students at Berkeley, so I'll never forget that moment. But I do have a question and maybe a comment, and it is about the phrase, all governments lie. And there's a problem, the problem I have with that, and I'd love your answer to it, is that that's a little bit like Ronald Reagan saying, government is the problem, not the solution. So my question, Paul, is very much uh, the last one. So in a sense, when both sides the Republicans, all governments lie. You can't trust government. Get, government is the problem. 
and then people who I sympathize with on the left say, all governments are corrupt, all governments are dishonest. Mm -hmm. Where is the role for government mm -hmm. in that kind of a dialectic, right? Mm -hmm. Where is the role of government in dealing with poverty and in fixing problems like Katrina and social justice around the world, in global warming and so on? So my worry is that we now have, and certainly the students I teach, just a whole generation of students who've grown up completely distrustful of any possibility of public collective action for the social good through government. And I just wonder how much the, this sort of mantra from across the political spectrum, all governments lie, helps us in thinking about what the role of government should be. But don't in a you think that like that's a, a, let's face it, it's been a very realistic comment for a very long time. This book is a history of the yeah. 20th century. And in it, uh, we're not just talking about, uh, we're talking about L LBJ, we're talking about Nixon, we're talking about what Izzy wrote about Warren G. Harding, we're talking about what he wrote, and even wrote about what FDR did. It's, it, it, the concept that I used it for it is that we're talking about a knowledge that people should have. Journalists should have this knowledge. Sure. They should be looking every time they talk to somebody with this in mind, that does not mean that one is as bad as another or that one is, uh, you know, is, is venal. I think we're in, in, in horrible straits in the last five or six years. And one of the reasons that I did the title was in hopes that people would look at what's going on today uh, as well as what Izzy said about it. Right. And as far as having a sense of social conscience, it's, it's almost not there anymore. Everybody who gets elected has to be a millionaire or a billionaire. Uh, I'm helping with a candidate that's trying to beat Mary Bono in California, and the the whole system of of trying to do something decent for just the little people has been absolutely abrogated uh, on that level because who pays for the campaign? And so I'm I, I, I maybe I'm just cynical, but I would love to see something that could excite young people today in government. And I don't see it. I think that the way we can look at it is through the people who keep hammering away at them. Yeah. But the question I would put about your candidate, if it's true that all governments lie all of the time, then why would anybody support a progressive candidate uh, uh -huh. such as you're supporting? They would just say, that's just another one, because mm. the emphasis is on the word all. Mm. And again, surely it's got to be a little bit relative. Yeah. Well, you can tell Simon and Schuster that the next printing to change the title. To <laughs> well, you know, if, 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 if I might, I think you raise a really beyond the title a really important question, which is that the failures of this administration, its incompetence, its almost willful incompetence, has gone it's far farther to to advance the conservative attack on government than anything they have done in policy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Their failures, in other words, are their successes ideological success, for precisely the reason you said. But, yes, what, but you have to look at was this incredibly acquiescent um, uh, lapdog press for the last five years. Mm. I, I mean, there were all kinds of... I'm trying to set up the concept that it is up to journalists to get behind the smoke and mirrors. And I can't tell you a, a politician who doesn't use smoke and mirrors. They're not going to say anything that doesn't sound positive for them. And that's the concept. You can take it as a large conceit or a small one. But the concept I was trying to get at was the bravery and the courage and the intelligence to get behind what any official spokesperson says. And the last five years, I, I call it you know, the, the worst media propaganda blitz that I've ever seen. And the fact that they were sitting there and not writing about it is, is, is horrendous. And that's the point I've been making in the book. Well, and I quite agree with that. Yeah. yeah thank, you. thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Bart Haig. I happen to have had a long career in, in government service and have dealt with journalists. Um, my question is, what is, what was, uh, could you elaborate on uh, Izzy's philosophy on filtering Ironically, as I was coming over on the tee, I read the article in the Current Nation by Eric uh, Bullard on the, the whole issue of filtering. 
in terms of what you were just talking about. Um, filtering meaning? In terms of what his philosophy was on filtering, um, particularly the what journalist that has a quick, a short deadline, what they can do to filtering. Um, in filtering, my own you mean role, in what respect? Filtering, sort of going behind the news, is this really true, you know, and so on, and, and, and questioning it right there. Well, I think it's really good research too. Well, it's mm -hmm. it's not just research. It's 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 a long span of research. It's being able to say that's not what you said two years ago, and that's reading and thinking. And uh, uh, you know, there are journalists who have that uh, base in their. You know, they they, re they they cover something long enough, and it's a beat long enough, and they can hear the rhythm of something that's not accurate or and and can remember something and that's what i think is really failing today there there is no institutional memory about anything and when you hear something and you don't have the click that says i've got to check that out um, then then you can't do it yeah yeah i guess the the question really is what did is he have to say that would help us encourage journalists to essentially screen, to filter, well, I think and so I, on. I spent um, quite a bit of time saying what he, you know, what he said, which is to look it up, you know, mean, read the documents, get, get people who are like in, in a level below the top level who can yeah. say, so-and-so said this, but this is the accurate fact. Uh, do your own thinking and do your own uh, quantifying of what you're getting. That's what he did all the time. And, and stay out of the, don't lunch with anybody. <laughs> Go to the Van Ness yeah. cafeteria and have a that cup helps. of tea. Yeah. Don't lunch. Mm -hmm. Don't lunch with the sources. Don't get, that's what happens in Washington. Well, you know, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the reporters become prisoners of their sources. Yeah. And therefore, and then we are essentially, there's, there's no filter. We're just. The other thing is a lot of journalists are into the mode, how can, uh, again, overcome the mode where they feel they have to come up with something sort of quick and sensational. I've had problems in trying to get news out or something out that gets to the basic issues because they wanted a quick yeah. thing. Uh, and they could have had those basic issues um, again with their overnight deadline. Right. Well, yeah, it's a uh, well taken uh, point, I think. I think that Izzy used to say that he did not like, the Washington Post, when I was there and everybody else, had what somebody said, I won't use the crime, but it was the holy blank story, which is you read it and you say, oh my God. And uh, Izzy was not like that. He would save the pieces of a puzzle until he had enough to write a, a, a piece in depth. And I agree with you entirely that, every, that a lot of things is now just sensation-based, uh, if it's going to get into the paper or on television, particularly on television. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Pat. I think I want to follow up along those lines. And it seems to me that there, there's more than the individual journalists digging for facts in play today. There's a whole row of editors and owners who actually ultimately determine what is printed or what is heard on radio, on television, on talk shows. And how did Izzy Stone circumvent that layer of, of mm. obstacles, and how are people doing it today? Mm. Well, he didn't. I mean, as I said, he could not find a, a place to work, and his, his line was that I always thought that uh, every paper I worked on would close on Monday, and they always did. Uh, and uh, he had a... a, a he had no other choice but to write his own. Uh, and he had this great line, he said, to be able to sit in your bathtub and want for nothing is the perfect way to live. And he was free from those, those restraints. And I think it's very difficult to be in a, a, a mainstream media today. You, you, you uh, have, have an awful lot of um, problem, I think, trying to get past what what the publisher might want. I don't want to start naming newspapers, but um, 
It's just not the place it used to be when I was working. Mm. Um, and, and there is an arrogance of the press that is just su surpassing. I mean, the New York Times did not run their story about the domestic wiretapping. For 14 months. They did not run it for 14 months, and, they, and the editor really was, I think, uh, obfuscatory, to be polite, in saying why and dating when they had it. They had it, in other words, before the, the 2004 election. election, but because they didn't want to interfere in the election, they didn't run it. Yes. Now, who elected the New York Times? And who made that man God? You know, so long as newspaper editors have that kind of arrogance, we are at the mercy of totally uh, unelected people who have a, an outsized sense of their own power. That editor does, it seems to me. Well, you know, it, it doesn't really alter things enough, but there seems to sometimes, as I viewed historically, um, sort of cyclical corrections. You know, after McCarthy, there were a lot of breastfeeding of newspapers and, and television say we should have been yeah. faster, we should have been better, we should have nailed this guy. The same thing after Vietnam. Mm. Now it's after weapons of mass destruction. Mm. And so there's this, this little blip of sort of being more reliable and responsible. And now I see ombudsmen. There's a, the New York Times has an ombudsman who took them to task for this very thing you're yep. talking yep. about. And... Um, I have no real answers, but I think that when they do have that power, and, and I, I guess what I'm saying is that the blogs are good in that respect, because somebody like Greg Pallas would say that and, and, get, get, it and, and get it out. And right. uh, he did a, a really marvelous piece in Florida at the time of the oh, elections. Really? And I was covering the 2000 election, and my husband had been a very liberal state senator and he was not in anymore, and we were just dying at the, at the coverage and uh, found out that all of the blacks had been disenfranchised, and we, would, we were writing everything, we were talking about it. Catherine Harris gets up and says what she wants to say, and half the papers ran it, and it's, it's a, it's a never-ending battle. It's a truly mm -hmm. never-ending battle. Yeah. Uh, yes. Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Ella Palmer Pinsong. I'm black American mixed with a little bit of American Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I'm just amazed that I'm here tonight because I grew up in poverty in Alabama, picking cotton, shopping mm -hmm. cotton, the whole bit. And I'm ashamed, but I, I'm not really um, acquainted with ISI. So this was really a very enlightening experience for me. But I come to the Cambridge Forum as often as I can to learn. But what I wanted to say to the gentleman that was speaking about the new journalists of today and, yes, speaking like and how um, maybe they are not addressing the way he would hope they would address social issues. So. Given that I did escape the cornfields mm. and I ended up with a little bit of an education mm. and I had been trained to sacrifice for principles mm. and for humanity. Mm. So given that, I thought that I would do my best to address a couple of issues. Mm. They, this was totally unplanned to a, a certain degree. Feminized poverty and the thought was jump-started by Charles Thoreau. He wrote an article in 1984. The bottom line of the article was, it seems that government would never address feminized uh, poverty. So, so I said, so maybe I need to try to do this a little bit. Then in 19, I guess it was 1994, uh, Mr. Jack Beatty wrote an article <laughs> And he said there's some great unaddressed issues, and one of those issues would be crime. He has a beautiful picture of a young black child holding the hand of an adult. Um, I followed these issues for about 24 years across the Harrow and the Boston Globe, namely three issues, women in poverty, abuse of the mentally ill, and mm. black crime. Okay, 
Mr. Beatty wrote in 1994. In 204, somebody from the Boston Globe, I can't remember who, who wrote it, shows a picture of a black man in the jail. The issue seemingly did not get better across 24 years. I tracked them, 24 years, reading the Globe, reading the Herald, every single living day. Today, I'm in poverty. I don't have changing clothes, and I'm about to lose my teeth. But it's something I can't turn loose because of how I'm trained, that if you are committed, you got to be committed to the cause. So I'm very glad that you presented here today to let me know about ISI. Uh, it would be good if I could run into some high society, like <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Stern. I need that. We all need a Mrs. Stern. <laughs> <laughs> but before I lose this point, back to uh, the instructor for journalism, what I noted, one thing that I really noted about those articles, maybe there were recommendations in articles or in the literature, but there was a failure to implement recommendations. Right, right. There, I right. couldn't hear the, what was it? Yeah. A failure to um, implement recommendations. So it seems with these three issues, there are a lot of scholars who talk about it, they write about it, but it doesn't seem to get to the place where it needs to be. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Case in point. I, I, when, I, oh, I, you know, I, 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 I'd like, I, personally want to hear this all night, but we really have to, okay, well, our let subject me, let was. Me close it. Let sure, me close it sure. this, sir. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the book. Mm. Uh, when I jumped into this, I didn't know that the people who got on that platform were, were putting down 24 and 30 years. It, all of this is a total surprise to me. So I really thank you for taking your time. I wanted to also tell you thank that you. I, I'm glad you raised this question. It's, it's a really heartfelt problem. And, Izzy uh, was one of the great champions of uh, civil rights in America, and he started very young. Uh, very young. He tried to bring a, an African-American judge to the press club in 1941, and they wouldn't even be served lunch. And then, so Izzy resigned, and then he tried to get 25 people to go along on this issue, and only 10 would, and so, and then when, he, when they did integrate, he wanted to go back and they blackballed him. But he, I have a whole chapter in here of how he fought and wrote, and I might add, wrote incredibly important things when the New York Times, the Washington Post, everybody else was just laying down and saying nothing. And five years before Martin Luther King surfaced, Izzy said, what this country needs is a black Gandhi. And, uh, mm -hmm. and he has a quote here that he says, ours is the world's oldest and most successful experiment in apartheid. Mm. And he wrote that in 1966. So he was a champion, and uh, I, I devoted a, a chapter to this because I think it's so important that people try to learn about it today. Yeah. Well, but what it, I decided, um, government lie or not lie, we, some of us are going to have to bubble up. And yeah. we're going to have to sacrifice to do that, right. regardless of what government does. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Thanks for writing your book. Uh, why? Do you have any thoughts on why uh, there's no one doing today the kind of thing that I.F. Stone did? I mean, both the kind of journalism and the format of, let's say, uh, I.F. Stone Weekly. Well. I don't think that that's what I think. I, I, th I feel that... Or am I missing it? Yeah, I feel that, yeah. The, that there are bloggers who are doing it. Again, Izzy had a, a one-man band along with, with his uh, wife and the few little assistants that he would have, and he ran this thing off of a dining room table. He, he went to a, a, a printer, had it printed, sent it out, he managed to make money at $5 a year because when you get 70,000 people and you add that up, it's 350,000 in, in a period. But he and uh, George Seldes before him who wrote, in fact, were actually the only two 
single publishers in America in the 20th century who, who were able to make a living on it. Do you think it's, it's, a pro it's a product of the times and that that way of doing yes, it doesn't and, work and, and today? Yes, exactly, and going down to some place and finding a printer and having the money, right. I mean, I have no idea how much it would even do, cost, do, plus, you know, disseminating. As we were saying, you can reach several million people on the internet, and he, the most he ever did get was 70,000. Yeah. So well, to actually yeah. publish a broadsheet today, I think, would be uh, really prohibitive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm too old, but I, it was easier for me to read I Have Stone yes. Weekly than to, I to read blogs. So. I agree. Yeah. I, <laughs> yes, I, that's, true. I, that's it's, true. It's wonderful to read. I have the same. Uh, I have the thank you. Yes, sir, I think this will be a... I, uh, I see it on the internet, but I didn't realize it that's, was still. But that's uh, not uh, counterpunch. The gentleman says is a is a. But comparable. that's not one person. Well, it's two. It's two. Well, two. It's, a, it's just a few pages. It's actually very similar format, and it is there is a hard copy. The pricing. Of, the problem with the internet is how do you get the money? Yeah. Right. right. But how much right. uh, counterpunch is? Forty dollars a year, and you buy a VIP edition. And how many people buy it? Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. This will be question. a last question. Real quick question. The comment you made about uh, don't uh, you know have lunch with your sources. I remember many years ago, and people in Cambridge, I saw this documentary about is he on. Yes. Uh, sorry, when we still had a theater called the Orson Welles yes. Theater here. That's how long ago it was. The Brown. Uh, and I, I, all these years, I do remember him. He was complaining about Walter Cronkite and others because they would go to the banquets and have lunch. Is that uh, documentary still available? Or I anything? can't find. Uh, I I saw it too, and I mm -hmm. used it. And everybody's trying to find Jerry Brook, Peter Osnos, who was in it and was an uh, assistant to Izzy. We haven't we haven't that, been able be to find it. To but it was a very again. good documentary. But Again, Walter Cronkite was very late to Vietnam, and uh, 1960, it was after Tet, and Izzy had been saying so oh, yeah. much beforehand. So was Edward R. Murrow about McCarthy, and Edward R. Murrow always it, said that they were late, and he always talked about corporate restrictions. That's, that is very, very much a problem in a free press, is that we, you know, the old cliche line, of a pre, uh, the free press is free for somebody who can afford it, and uh, Izzy always used to say that an owner was a guy who made a million dollars selling toilet paper and bought a newspaper as a tax write-off. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you, you, there, those constraints are just there. It's, it's terrible to say, but they're there. Well, if that documentary could resurface, I think it would yeah. be great. To I mean, yeah. I could, is I cannot it? tell you how many people I don't think could be published in the Washington Post today who were published there when I was writing for it. It's changed enormously. Thank and you. it's the corporate, corporatization of the media. This is not what this book is, but that's what, what, what everybody's sort of addressing, and I can understand why. Final question. Izzy once told me that he lost more readers after he went to the Soviet oh, Union yeah. in 56, I'm not sure, 55, and he came back and he said, this is a prison house of the spirit. Yes. This is a gray on gray place. No vitality, no freedom, no life. And, and he knew when he wrote it that that was going to cost him, he didn't realize it was going to cost him quite so much. And yeah. I think, he and, lost and that was part of his fearlessness too. He would buck his audience. He would cross them if he had the truth to tell. Well, but it's interesting because I, I use a great deal of that column in the book, and he, it's so much deeper than the few lines that are always quoted. He said, um, you know, he said, the way home from Moscow has been agony for me. I feel like a swimmer underwater who must rise to the surface or his lungs will burst. And then he gave a reason for his less than candid earlier appraisals. Friends had warned him to temper his criticism in the cause of a worthy expediency the fight for world peace. But he could keep silent no longer. And this is what he said, I hate the morass into which one wanders when one begins to withhold the truth because the consequences might be bad. Mm. And he just went, mm. and he had seen the destruction of his socialist ideals everywhere. And then, of course, after the 1956 um, Hungarian uh, uh, attack on Hungary, he was just absolute on it. And um, another thing he said, and 
as I said, not only was is he proven right after the fact, he was often right at the time. Mm -hmm. And there, there was a new book out saying, well, there's really new knowledge here that John Foster Dulles and everybody else uh, really didn't do enough to help out uh, during the attack um, on Hungary. And so Izzy writes, at the time, faced at last with the possibility of that liberation they so long preached, Mr. Dulles and his friends in Western Germany are soft peddling the anti-communist re revolution, which was a signal to Moscow that it can crush the new revolution without fear of our intervention. Yeah. So he was catching all sides mm -hmm. of it at he, the same time. He certainly time. was. Myra, I have to sign, we have to sign off. Thank you so much, Myra McPherson. And I'll try to sign some books if you want them. <laughs> Thank you.